Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netroomsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. We're dragging major news in the New York criminal uh, criminal probe into the Trump organization, and we now have two experts with me, uh, lawyers who know a lot about this stuff. Manhattan DA candidate Tolly for Heidi and Weinstein. We should note for full disclosure, she did run against Mr. Bragg in the primaries and also knows a lot about this office and these issues. We're also joined by Adam Kaufman, who's the former executive assistant, DA, and chief of the investigative division of the Manhattan DA's office. Uh, welcome to both of you. Uh, I think viewers know this was a big case. It was one of the main criminal probes that touched uh, Donald Trump himself, potentially. His whole company still under indictment. Tali, your reaction to this news? Well, Ari, I'm focused on what Pomerantz and Dunn were trying to tell us with these coordinated silent resignations because, you know, as you know, prosecutors can't grab the mic and say very much, so small moves can mean a lot. And I think their resignations are full of meaning. I think they're trying to tell us two things. One is, as you said, they've had a big disagreement with the district attorney. As you know, they stayed on to work this case. January 1st, they decided to be a part of his administration. Something happened between them and him in the last six weeks. Uh, and it seems as that he has abandoned the case and they who are living and breathing it think that he has made a wrong decision. That's my best read. I think the other thing that they're trying to tell us, and this is really important, is that it can't just go out with a whimper and that he is going to need to make some kind of public statement of declination, if that is in fact what he has done, or some other sort of explanation uh, to sort of demystify uh, what seems in some ways quite mysterious. Really interesting. Appreciate uh, your view. Uh, as mentioned, you know a lot about this. And Adam, so do you. Um, so I ask you your take on both what is in the New York Times piece, uh, which is a big story uh, by any account, uh, and specifically the point Tolly makes, that it, it would appear that these prosecutors were going towards something. They stayed through the beginning of this term. Now they're bolting. Does that mean that Mr. Bragg ultimately perhaps overruled uh, the desire to indict Donald Trump himself. Your read. I'm, I'm astounded. Um, my, my phone's been blowing up. My email's going crazy. A lot of former colleagues. We're all sort of speculating, Ari. And, you know, you, you really outlined it quite well in the run-up. We don't quite know what happened. But I do agree. I mean, prosecutors don't resign simultaneously like this unless there was a major disagreement between them and the DA. Otherwise, they probably would have stayed on and seen this through to the end. Um, there's a great team, I think, that has this, the existing case, the Weisselberg case and the Trump organization for the indictment that's already been filed. But for Mark and Kerry to resign simultaneously, it is, it's a huge message. And to me, it speaks to a significant disagreement between the two of them and the new district attorney. 
Uh, build on that. The disagreement would be that they felt they had worked up to another move, a move of indicting Donald Trump for something. I mean, again, this is not Whoa. some... Well, just to finish the thought, then I'll let you go. This is not some giant complex company that has rotating CEOs and boards and multinational, multi-country. No, it, Donald Trump's organization was indicted for its practices. Uh, it is a very small family company with him at the top. Uh, so it doesn't seem like a legal stretch that they would have gone on beyond indicting the corporate fiction to the to the person himself. Go ahead. So so strange. I mean, there could be a few things. What What's one thing that's strange to me is that from what we know, there were more witnesses who they wanted to put before the grand jury and gather more information. And that seems to have been put on hold. That to me is very strange because why wouldn't you go ahead put the witnesses in, see what they have to say, and get a little more evidence before making whatever decision was made. Um, prosecutors would probably not do this, resign this way, unless there was a disagreement. Now, we don't know. It could go either way, right? It could be that that the lead prosecutors thought that they should move on with the case. Uh, Mr. Bragg disagreed and they resigned, or they thought there was no case, um, and Mr. Bragg wanted them to go on, and so they resigned. I would speculate as to the former rather than the latter, but yep. um, we, you know it does definitely look like there was a significant disagreement that caused these two very experienced, very capable, very skilled attorneys to walk away from a huge investigation, which th there is a message there. Tolly? I agree. And, you know, I think a particularly curious uh, thing in the reporting today was that uh, Mr. Bragg instructed them in the middle of January to slow down, uh, which, you know, I have to agree is just really strange. Uh, maybe the disagreement should have come to a head uh, as the grand jury was set to expire and they had to make a final decision about pursuing an indictment. Uh, but uh, that is very hard to understand and to explain why you would do that rather than to maximize your time in front of this grand jury to get as much evidence as possible. And so I think putting that together with the fact that uh, they were deeply read into this case. Remember, Mr. Dunn was the person who argued the tax returns in front of the Supreme Court. I mean, this has been what he's been doing day in and day out now for years, uh, to suddenly be told to kind of waste your time uh, that you have left on the clock that is ticking uh, must have been uh, very hard for them to hear, is my guess. Yeah, and Adam, I want to build on the point we raised in the setup, which is not to prejudge any potential case. Uh, we, we cover it as it comes. But there certainly was a drumbeat where they feel they had enough to move on the CFO and the whole company, as mentioned. The accounting firm walks away under pressure after years of riding with Trump. Uh, people are familiar with the term ride or die. Um, well, they weren't ride or die. Uh, the heat got to the point that they said, you know what, we can't stand by this. Apparently this stuff is false. Um, that in the in the so-called Humpty Dumpty case uh, hurt Trump as well. Uh, and so there was the sign that the pressure was working. Does that mean that you have a bulletproof case against someone who ducks email and responsibility and paper trails? No, it doesn't. But it certainly seemed to be going that way. Um, can you think of any valid reason why Mr. Bragg may have looked at this and said, uh, in all fairness, there just wasn't any case on Trump? I mean, sure. That, that That's, you know, as, as you said in the run up, um, reasonable lawyers can look at any set of facts and come to different conclusions. What I keep coming back to is that these two very experienced attorneys, experienced prosecutors, um, both have been on both sides of they both have huge track records as former de white collar defense attorneys. They're leaders of the defense bar. Uh, they came on to the DA's office. They ran this investigation. As Tali said, this went up to the Supreme Court uh, for Kerry to argue that motion. Big win. And yeah, so, big win. Yeah, I mean, if, if it were a typical um, disagreement or a typical the case is puttering out, then I would expect them to stay on let the grand jury expire and and there's no action that would that would sort of send one signal that we just didn't have enough evidence here to go forward but this simultaneous resignation um what is it six weeks into mr bragg's tenure as da it just sends a message that uh they had a belief about the case that he would not sign on to 
Uh, it's pretty, I mean, it's just the only reasonable explanation to me. And Tali, uh, this job is very high profile in New York. It's, it's not something that nationally everyone may keep track of, but Mr. Bragg has been immediately under a vice pressure from police unions, the police leadership, um, doing a dance with the mayor, pressure from Albany. Um, he is a rookie. Uh, I emphasize only out of fairness to our viewers the disclosure that uh, you ran against him. That doesn't make you unique. We have guests all the time who have experiences and know people in public life. Uh, but with that disclosure made, do you think that at some level uh, this was too much pressure for him to handle and that he sounds different than he did when he ran? Well, you know, I can't speak to what he's thinking about, Ari, but uh, you are right to say that this office uh, is a local office, but one with national scope. And I think that it's just not possible for this to be treated like any other case and for us not to hear from him. Uh, as to what he is thinking about his ultimate decision in this case. You know, obviously prosecutors can't make a public statement every time they decide not to bring charges. That's just not going to fly here. History is watching him. Uh, and this is bigger than whether he has had a rough s start, whether uh, his policies so far have been received favorably or unfavorably by people in Manhattan. Uh, this is really about making sure that there's not just accountability, but really confidence in institutions like this one, uh, that good choices are being made and that the right thing is being done. It is Thursday, the 24th of February of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life, as if, well, chicken kiev is not enough spice for you. Well, chicken kiev in and of itself isn't necessarily a spicy dish. But uh, looks like uh, Russia has made certain that that will be the case. And when I say Russia, of course, I don't mean the Russian people. We mean the demagogue madman who's running the show, the mobster, Vladimir Putin. Wow. He wishes it was 1975 again. Or, I don't know, maybe he wants it to be 1945. He hated Yalta. Well... So did we. <laughs> we should have never given up all that land to uh, Stalin. But I got to tell you, the tanks were already there. <laughs> I don't know what FDR could have done. But uh, hey, here we are again. You know, at least uh, at least we're not mired in Afghanistan. <laughs> at least. I know that uh, Joe came out and said that uh, really military involvement from the United States is off the table. But we do have an agreement with the UN and NATO, and we will be part of, I think what they call it is an expeditionary force. We need some blue helmets on the ground, and they need to uh, be able to, shall we say, enforce, mm -hmm, enforce the peace. Putin is not going into Ukraine with peacekeepers to denazify a country run by a Jewish guy. Please. <laughs> I just love it. He calls, or they call, he and they in the Russian leadership are calling the government of Ukraine a junta. A fascist junta. I'll tell you what a fascist junta is. Russia. Wow. Uh, a lot of people have been commenting that Vlad was really cray-cray in that speech where he invoked the idea of nukes. I will nuke you. Um, I thought maybe some of this bellicose behavior right now, I, I, I'm just wondering if this is a long-term COVID symptoms. I think, or do we know, Did, didn't Vlad have COVID? I know that he took many, many precautions to not get it. 
But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, this is happening. It's only been in the works for decades, but all of a sudden it's happening. (laughs) Yeah, the concept of time to Russia or a Russian is a little bit different than the go-go, let's get it right now, American attitude about time. All right. They don't go on to the 50, 70 year plan and just go, you know, that's a long time. I don't know if I can take it. Nope. Short amount of time. Okay. So uh, Vlad is out there warning the world and the United States in particular. I will no you. And then Fox, Murdoch, and all of the Republican Party stands up and says, can we help? Why don't we sanction Murdoch and Fox? I mean, we gotta. <laughs> Can't have that propaganda outfit spewing this BS on a nightly, well, nightly, 24-hour basis. It's bad enough that we got 73 million, do- 73 million uh, people who will take up arms against the United States and help Vlad take over. No wonder Mary Garland is keeping it close to the vest. So what's up with the Manhattan DA's office? Right after Mazars gave up the records on Trump because of criminal activity that they could not defend themselves against. And now suddenly the lead prosecutors are out Is the new DA bought off by the Russian mob? Teflon Don gets away with it again. Oh, well, you know, rich people aren't supposed to be brought to, you know, prison for criminal charges. They need to be fined. That's what rich people should do to to, uh, rectify their criminal behavior. Buy it off. I guess. Or maybe there's a secret OLC memo that says that you can't uh, indict or imprison a former president who's laundering Russian mob money. Maybe. Right after Mazars gives up the goods, the two lead prosecutors leaving off... Something's fishy in Denmark. Mm-hmm. Something stinks. Will we find out? Well, I hope that we get to listen to uh, the two prosecutors who left. I hope that they give some sort of public statement. And the new DA, Bragg, needs to, you know, explain himself. He does. So maybe Vlad started this war to take the heat off Donnie because of the Mazar accounting firm giving up the goods and the Manhattan DA being bought off or threatened. I want to know if there was a horse's head in the Manhattan DA's uh, bed when he woke up in the morning. We're going to make you an offer you can't refuse. You killed my favorite horse. I don't know. Something happened. And it doesn't bode well. If the two lead prosecutors... Now, this is what's confusing. This new DA actually was part of, and I believe argued, uh, in court to bring the Trump organization to heal and find them, what, the 20 million bucks? I think that that was... Yeah, yeah, that that prevents uh, the kids from being able to run a charity. And now he comes in on the case when two uh, well-respected national prosecutors, attorneys, one who's an expert on RICO and was brought in specifically to apply RICO to this, resign in protest? Or was Bragg reminded that there's a lot of high rises to have some convenient falls? You know, don't be moving a piano into a condo you don't own. Nothing bodes well with that. It has a track record, in fact. Something happened there. 
And Trump is up to his eyeballs in criminal activity. We've known it forever. You don't get kicked out of the sharper image just because, I don't know, you have a defective product. You don't get kicked out for that reason. You're not denied ownership of an NFL team (laughs) because, I don't know. (laughs) Think of it. As corrupt as the NFL is, they wouldn't take in Donald Trump because he was too corrupt or is too corrupt. And that's why he started the USFL. And look how great that was. Uh Uh-huh. Everything he touches. Everything. And now representative democracy is on the table. Yes, it is. The hammer and the sickle. Gonna cleave representative democracy into the small bits it deserves. Because apparently imperialism... Authority and empire are much more important than the will of we mere people. Apparently. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy as we begin this fabulous Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursday? Hey, it's War Day! Thanks, Vlad. On the rest of the menu, despite pushback from the EPA, Postmaster General Louis DeJoy signed off on the next generation of mail vehicles, most of them gas guzzlers. 5,000 electric vehicles and all the rest. Hundreds of thousands of gas guzzling vehicles. Thanks, Louis An Amazon union organizer was arrested at a New York City facility on charges of trespassing. We're we're back to that. 1975, 1945, we're going right back to 1910. And the Missouri Republican Party said it would not accept a filing fee from a state representative who was facing federal fraud charges. You got to be pretty damn corrupt for the Republican Party to deny your application to be running for office. I I thought that was a prerequisite. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Haitian police open fire on demonstrators, killing a journalist. And as Ukraine came under Russian attack, the Ukraine ambassador told the Russian UN ambassador, There is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Busy as she be, she always has time for Netroots Radio, so thank you so much, Kelly. To the left of that chat room link across the page, near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and if you could afford to send us what you might spend on on an espresso-type coffee drink, for instance, if you could send those funds our way once a month, we are able to stretch those dollars beyond compare, even during these perilous times. And uh, then we pay our bills and uh, pay off the continuous upgrades of software and hardware. How dare they? Even in these perilous times. But your help helps us because we take this, uh, well, this civic duty of running this powerhouse of resistance quite seriously. And we've been doing it for almost 11 years. In about a month or so, less than that, just a few weeks we will be officially celebrating 
our 11th anniversary of when we went totally at uh, 24-7, 365. We were inching along and getting our uh, our feet under us when we began. And then, and then we went full bore <laughs> and have not stopped. And we have not stopped because of folks like you who encourage us. And that encouragement is uh, very helpful. And thank you for helping us once a month. Uh, boy, these bills keep going up. Everything does, doesn't it? Thank you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it is so simple. You just go to at Netroots Radio. How simple is that? Tom takes care of it, and we thank Tom for that as well. Busy as he be, he always has time for Netroots Radio, and we appreciate all the help that you guys have been giving us over all these years. Hey, we're a team. All right. You know you can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam because, and you know, I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Coast about 10 minutes before showtime and they get that linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. The show notes and links, of course, are the important part of the show because that's really where the real reportage can be found. Follow the show on Twitter at CookbookQuest and please do. Pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, wherever podcasts can be found. And do not forget, do not forget that the uh, Netroots Radio Library Deep Archive can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org, Netroots Radio Library. Yeah, we'll get that uh, general link up on the homepage real soon, as I've been mentioning, because we have the yearly update on that page coming up soon. And, uh, of course, you can find uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy uh, Deep Archive link on the show notes and links at Daily Coast. And, you know, when I'm posting it on Twitter and others, that'll take you there. I'm sorry about the ads. I don't get them because, you know, somebody bought me a subscription years ago because I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. People are generous. All right, we better get into this uh, curated part of the show before we have to evacuate because the Russians are are invading. You never know. You never know. They got 73 million people who are willing to help them. Vlad says, I will nuke you. And, and the Republican Party says, can we help? Just like, you know what? The Republican Party is that weasley little mayor in Red Dawn. And he got put up against the rock pile, too. I'm just saying. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the uh, Associated Press by David Sharp. The U.S. Postal Service said yesterday, Wednesday, it cleared the final regulatory hurdle to placing orders for the next generation mail vehicles and getting some of them on the delivery routes this next year despite pushback from the Environmental Protection Agency. Postmaster General Louis DeJoy, how is it that that guy is still there? Well, we know why. Said the completion of an evaluation required by the National Environmental Policy Act is an important milestone for postal carriers who have soldiered on with overworked delivery trucks that went into service between 1987 and 1994. The U.S. Postal Service's fleet comprises of more than 230,000 vehicles. That includes 190,000 local delivery vehicles and more than 141,000 are the older vehicles made by federal, federal contractor Grumman. The men and the women of the U.S. Postal Service have waited long enough for safer, cleaner vehicles, DeJoy said in a statement, smirking, I bet. Environmental groups have pushed back because only 10% of the vehicles would be electric-powered under the Postal Service contract with manufacturer Wisconsin-based Oshkosh Defense. They went from coveralls to making mail vehicles. The decision published in the Federal Register allows the Postal Service to proceed with placing the first order 
that will include eh, about 5,000 electric-powered vehicles, along with an undetermined number of gas-powered vehicles. Oh, undetermined, you mean like another 185,000 maybe? The Postal Service believes it has met all its obligations and is moving forward despite criticism by the EPA over the adequacy of the environmental review. After signing the contract to procure these vehicles one year ago, the Postal Service continued a fundamentally flawed environmental analysis that underestimates the costs of gasoline-fueled vehicles and overestimates the costs associated with electric vehicles, Vicky Arroyo, EPA's Associate Administrator for Policy, said. Brenda Mallory, chair of the White House's Council on Environmental Quality, criticized the Postal Service as, quote, out of touch with technology and, quote, putting itself at a disadvantage compared to cr- competitors. Well, that's the whole point. DeJoy wants to destroy the U.S. Postal Service and privatize it. Neither rain, nor sleet, nor financial good sense will stop the leaders of the U.S. Postal Service from trying to buy dirty, polluting delivery vehicles. uh, Patricio Portillo of the Natural Resources Defense Council said. But DeJoy, an ally of former President Donald Trump, you know, an embed, said more of the electric vehicles can be purchased under the contract if additional funding from either internal or congressional sources becomes available. He once again said with a smirk. It would cost an extra $3.3 billion to convert the entire Postal Service fleet to electric vehicles. Money is included in Biden's Build Back Better plan, but that proposal remains stalled in Congress. Wait stalled by the Nazi Republicans. Let's be clear here. The new vehicles are more environmentally friendly and boast modern amenities like climate control and safety features like airbags, backup cameras, and collision avoidance, all currently lacking on the aging Grumman vehicles. But hey, the electric vehicles are smart. The vehicles are also taller and make it easier for postal carriers to grab packages and parcels that have been making up a far greater portion of their deliveries even before the pandemic. Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. A former Amazon employee who is leading a push to unionize a New York City warehouse of the online retailer was arrested along with two others yesterday, Wednesday, after authorities got a complaint, I wonder from who, about him trespassing at the facility, police said. Christian Smalls faces charges of trespass, resisting arrest, and obstructing governmental administration. The New York Police Department said he was giving a desk appearance ticket and later released. Workers at Amazon's Staten Island facility are getting ready for a vote in late March on whether to unionize. Police said Smalls refused to leave the site when officers asked and was taken into custody. Two other men who police said tried to interfere were also taken into custody. Oh, you mean people who want to unionize. The other two men, both Amazon workers, were also facing obstructing governmental administration charges and were given desk appearance tickets. Seth Goldstein, a lawyer for the group Amazon Labor Union that's spearheading the unionization push, said Smalls, was merely dropping off food for workers when the trespassing complaint was made. This is simply Amazon creating a situation. It's a bad look, he said. 
In a statement, Amazon representative Kelly Nantel said Smalls has repeatedly trespassed despite multiple warnings. Today, when police officers asked Mr. Smalls to leave, he instead chose to escalate the situation, and the police made their own decision on how to respond, and now they're all Prime members. I added that last part. Smalls, 80, or Smalls age 33 was fired from Amazon after he organized a walkout at the beginning of the pandemic over safety concerns. The company said he had put others at risk by violating distancing rules. Oh, how cute. Amazon workers in a Bessemer, Alabama facility are also pushing to unionize. If either effort is successful... It would mark the first unionized Amazon facility in the U.S. The unionization battles have put a spotlight on Amazon and how it treats its workers. Pro-union warehouse workers have complained of long shifts and little time to take breaks. Amazon is the nation's second largest private employer behind Walmart. Staff bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Missouri Republican Party said it would not accept a filing fee from a state representative who is facing federal fraud charges. Representative Patricia Durgis, a first-term Republican from Nixa, was indicted last year by federal authorities who alleged she filed $900,000 in claims for COVID-19 treatments that were not performed or had already been performed. A 23-count indictment also alleges Durgis, an assistant physician, administered antibiotic fluid, which she falsely claimed contained stem cells as treatment for COVID-19 and other diseases. Missouri Republican Party Treasurer Pat Thomas said the party won't accept Durgis's candidate filing fee as long as she has felony charges pending against her. The filing for the August primary ends on March 29th. Druges, who was seeking re-election in the House, did not immediately respond to messages sent to her at the Capitol. She has been stripped of her committee assignments in the House and her narcotics license was placed on probation for three years earlier this month. Durgis has pleaded not guilty to the charges, and a trial is set for June 6. Well, let us get to our break now, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Ashley Papp. Monogamy in animals, and let's be honest, in humans too, is a funny thing. Only a few animal species have been lumped into the one partner for life category. And even then, there are exceptions to those rules. Prairie voles are furry little rodents that live throughout North America. They're a particularly interesting species because 
They form lifelong partnerships. Annalise Beery, a behavioral neuroscientist with Smith College in Massachusetts and the University of California at Berkeley, studies vole monogamy in the wild and in the lab. So I would define monogamy as a formation of a lasting partnership or a social relationship between mates. Social relationships are very important for human biology, and prairie voles are one of the only species that are studied in the lab that exhibit this trait. Monogamy is fairly rare in rodents, and it's also uh, unusual for rodents to form lasting social relationships of any kind. We already know about some things that support monogamy in the wild, like when mates are scarce and it makes sense to hold on to the one you're with, or when both sexes stick around to raise their young. But so far, there isn't one clear explanation as to why or how animals opt for only one partner. Whatever the reasons, staying monogamous requires effort from both sides. To better understand how lifelong bonding works, Beery and her team wanted to know if both male and female prairie voles make equal investments in making the long haul work. To find out, the researchers set up an experiment with three phases— In the first phase, they had to teach the prairie voles how to open a door controlled by a lever. It was actually really hard to get prairie voles to press a lever for a reward. And we had some voles who never learned the task and they were not included in the study. We had other voles who learned to press the lever in non-typical ways. One female liked to sit on the lever in order to activate it. And then one day something clicked and she turned around and started pressing it with her paw and getting the food pellet in the ordinary way. The team built on that skill by associating the lever pressing with a door opening. In phase two, there were two doors controlled by two different levers. One of the doors led to a cushy rodent pad complete with wood shavings, fresh produce and even Cheerios, while the other led to a shallow pool of water. And just FYI, these rodents really aren't into swimming pools. The voles could distinguish between two doors, two levers, and two different outcomes. And ultimately, both the males and females overwhelmingly pressed the lever that took them into the cushy chamber over the water torture. In phase three, they took a quick break from the lever pressing and introduced each vole to a member of the opposite sex. The two voles got 48 hours to bond and grow fond, And then the lever pressing resumed. Each of the trained voles were given the option of two levers and two doors again. But this time, one of the doors led to their partner, and the other led to a new member of the opposite sex. After all the little vole-sized levers were pulled, Beery and her team analyzed the results. They found that even when it comes to monogamous prairie voles, males and females sometimes have different priorities. So females worked hardest to get to familiar male mates uh, versus unfamiliar strangers. The males were interesting because they showed diverse behaviors. Some of them acted like the females and worked hardest to get to their mates consistently over the course of the study. Other males consistently worked hardest to get to unfamiliar females, and yet other males were sort of intermediate, where they would press more for a familiar female on one day and an unfamiliar female on the next day. Their results were published in the journal Genes, Brain, and Behavior. Overall, this points to a big difference between the sexes when it comes to social motivation. In other experiments, bull researchers have observed wandering, or a preference by males for the unfamiliar females. But many of those studies were performed out in the wild, and this research removed those external pressures. That seems to mean that some of these little males were sometimes flighty about staying true to their mate because, well, maybe they felt like it. According to Beery, putting vol monogamy to the test helps us better understand the different types of human relationships and our process for selecting who we spend time with. For prairie voles, the investment seems a bit skewed to the female side. But no need to throw shade on the males, Beery says. There's likely a legit explanation out there. And while science looks for that reason, maybe don't give up on finding your one true love quite yet. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Ashley Pat. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. When it snows this winter, make sure you clear more than your driveway. Before you hit the road and before you get in the driver's seat, 
check to be sure that your vehicle's tailpipe is clear of snow. If the tailpipe is blocked, carbon monoxide, an odorless, colorless, and deadly gas produced by your engine, can build up quickly inside your vehicle, poisoning anyone inside. To learn more, call 1-800-CDC-INFO. That's 1-800-232-4636. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Many Americans can't believe that political coups are part of our country's history. But consider the Wall Street pooch of 1933. Never heard of it? It was a corporate conspiracy to oust Franklin Roosevelt, who had just been elected president. With the Great Depression raging and millions of families financially devastated, FDR had launched several economic recovery programs to help people get back on their feet. To pay for this crucial effort, he had the audacity to raise taxes on the wealthy, and this enraged a group of Wall Street multimillionaires. Wailing that their, quote, liberty to grab as much wealth as possible was being shackled, they accused the president of mounting a class war. To pull off their coup, they plotted to enlist a private military force made up of destitute World War I veterans who were upset at not receiving promised federal bonus payments. One of the multimillionaire's lackeys reached out to a well-respected advocate for veterans, retired Marine General Smedley Darlington Butler. They wanted him to lead 500,000 veterans in a march on Washington to force FDR from the White House. But they chose the wrong general. Butler was a patriot and lifelong soldier for democracy who in his later years was critical of corporate war profiteering, and he was repulsed by the hubris and treachery of these Wall Street aristocrats. He reached out to a reporter, and together they gathered proof to take to Congress. A special congressional committee investigated and found Butler's story, quote, alarmingly true, leading to public hearings with Smedley Darlington Butler giving detailed testimony. This is Jim Hightower saying, By exposing the traitors, this courageous patriot nipped their coup d'etat in the bud. But their sense of entitlement reveals that we must beware of the concentrated wealth of the imperious rich for it poses an ever-present danger to your and my majority rule. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. It was a good day for the free press. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. And that was the statement of the chief executive of the New York Times after the jury and judge ruled against Sarah Palin in her libel suit against the paper. Palin's claim was based on a 2017 editorial that asserted that Palin had a causal connection to the 2011 mass shooting in Arizona that left six dead and 14 others wounded, including Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. The Times got it wrong. Contrary to the editorial, there was no evidence that Palin had incited the shooter. But Palin lost because she's a public figure. And a public figure in a libel case must prove that the newspaper published the falsehood knowing that it was false or with reckless disregard for whether it was true or not, what the law calls actual malice. It's a high standard, protective of the press, established by the Supreme Court in the 1964 case of New York Times versus Sullivan. But after the verdict, the press is not resting easy. Palin's case laid bare the Times' sloppy journalism in this instance, mitigated by its prompt correction and retraction. But this case has focused debate on how, in this case, or more likely in another, the high court will rule on how much a free press 
guaranteed by the First Amendment, should be protected on whether New York Times versus Sullivan should be affirmed or not. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1965. That was the day the Drug and Hospital Employees Union Local 1199 sent a telegram to President Lyndon Baines Johnson. The message declared the union's stand against U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. They were the first union local to take an official stand against the war. However, it should not have surprised anyone that Local 1199 was willing to take such a public stand. From their founding, they have been deeply committed to broad social justice unionism. The union started in 1932 in New York City. In the beginning, their membership was mostly Jewish men working in drugstores. During their first decade, they led pickets for a living wage and against segregation. During the 1950s, they held organizing drives in the city's not-for-profit hospitals. This brought many African-American and Latino women into the union. These workers were often paid wages as low as $32 per week and worked extremely long hours. The union helped them win a $100 a week minimum wage. The union had become an important voice for workers in the city's nonprofit hospitals. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called Local 1199 the authentic conscience of the labor movement. The union expanded its organizing beyond New York in 1969. They helped organize a successful strike of hospital workers in Charleston, South Carolina. From there, they launched organizing campaigns of hospital workers in other states. Over the years, the union has stood in solidarity with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Hayorta's efforts to organize farm workers. They opposed apartheid in South Africa. They were also an early opponent of the war in Iraq. Today, the local is affiliated with SEIU, the Service Employees International Union. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 20 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high, oh, in the upper 40s, oh, getting warmer. Abundant sunshine, winds light and variable, Cl- clear skies overnight with lows in the low 20s once again and mainly sunny tomorrow with highs in the mid 50s we can only hope confirmed cases of coronavirus continue to inch upwards we now stand at 417,082 confirmed cases and our deceased continue to stand at uh, 464 that's only standing for one day we'll see what it's like tomorrow Pollen is rated as none outside the window here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index is good at 41 parts per million, and that daytime UV index is moderate at level 3. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.4 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles, and relative humidity is at 93%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd. Crowdsources from around the world. London is 42 and partly cloudy. Paris is 45 and partly cloudy. Uh, Rome is 61 and fair. Kiev is 38 and cloudy with uh, looks like a chance of bombs raining and other sorts of things flooding the streets. Like... Military hardware. Back to the world again. Kabul is 36 and fair, or I'm clear. Uh, Hong Kong is 49 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 37 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 71 with showers in the vicinity. San Francisco, California is 41 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is a freezing 30 
degrees Fahrenheit and partly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Teddy Errol and Jessica Thomas of Reuters brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Haitian police opened fire on demonstrators yesterday, Wednesday, who were demanding higher wages and killed a reporter, according to witnesses, and a hospital official. Two other journalists were shot and wounded at the scene in Port-au-Prince, where hundreds of Haitians gathered to call for a higher minimum wage than the one approved this, this week by the government of Prime Minister Ariel Henry. A passing police vehicle fired at protesters, according to a Reuters witness and a union leader present. Dominique St. Alloy, a union leader who was at the demonstration, said it was calm when police began shooting from the vehicle. The protesters were mostly from the garment sector, which exports finished products to U.S. retailers. Those workers received a 37% increase that took their wages to just under seven, $7.50 a day, half of what the union leaders had demanded. The prime minister later condemned the brutal acts and pledged to protect peaceful demonstrators. The government reiterates the responsibility of public authorities to ensure order and security, Henry wrote on Twitter. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Michelle Nichols and Yumura Pamuk of Reuters brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The United States and other United Nations Security Council members slammed Vladimir Putin yesterday for attacking Ukraine as the 15-member body met in New York to try and defuse weeks of mounting tensions. At the exact same time as we gathered in the council seeking peace, Putin delivered a message of war and total disdain for the responsibility of this council. This is a grave emergency, U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield told the council. In an address on Russian TV broadcast at the same time as the U.N. Security Council began its meeting, Putin announced his military operation in eastern Ukraine. Russian forces fired missiles at several Ukrainian cities and landed troops on its south coast. Russia's U.N. ambassador notified the Council of Moscow's move during the meeting, justifying it under Article 51 of the U.N. Charter, which covers individual or collective self-defense by states against armed attack. Britain's U.N. ambassador Barbara Woodward described Russia's move on Ukraine as unprovoked and unjustified. Ukraine's U.N. ambassador said Russia had just declared war in its country and told the Russian ambassador at the end of the council meeting, there is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up tomorrow 
for Blue Moon Spirits Friday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the news as it breaks. <laughs> and it's breaking news, and it's breaking. So do stay tuned, and we'll uh, meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver